And even in the drama, which is the peculiar province of the passions and emotions, it is easy for them to appear common and vulgar, and this is especially observable in the works of the French tragic writers, who set no other aim before themselves but the delineation of the passions, and by indulging at one moment in a vaporous kind of pathos which makes them ridiculous, and another in epigrammatic witticisms, endeavor to conceal the vulgarity of their subject. I remember seeing the celebrated Mademoiselle Rachel as Maria Stuart, and when she burst out in fury against Elizabeth, though she did it very well, I could not help thinking of a washerwoman. She played the final parting in such a way as to deprive it of all true tragic feeling, of which, indeed, the French have no notion at all. The same part was incomparably better played by the Italian Ristori, and, in fact, the Italian nature, though in many respects very different from the German, shares its appreciation for what is deep, serious, and true in art. Herein opposed to the French, which everywhere betrays that it possesses none of this feeling whatever. The noble, in other words, the uncommon element in the drama, nay, what is sublime in it, is not reached until the intellect is set to work, as opposed to the will, until it takes a free flight over all those passionate movements of the will and makes them subject of its contemplation. Shakespeare, in particular, shows that this is his general method, more especially in Hamlet, and only when intellect rises to the point where the vanity of all effort is manifest and the will proceeds to an act of self-annulment. Is the drama tragic in the true sense of the word? It is then that it reaches its highest aim in becoming really sublime. Every man takes the limits of his own field of vision for the limits of the world. This is an error of the intellect as inevitable as that error of the eye which lets us fancy that on the horizon heaven and earth meet. This explains many things, and among them the fact that everyone measures us with his own standard, generally about as long as a tailor's tape, and we have to put up with it, as also that no one will allow us to be taller than himself, a supposition which is once for all taken for granted. There is no doubt that many a man owes his good fortune in life solely to the circumstance that he has a pleasant way of smiling, and so wins the heart in his favor. However, the heart would do better to be careful, and remember what Hamlet put down in his tablets, that one may smile and smile and be a villain. Everything that is really fundamental in a man, and therefore genuine, works as such unconsciously, in this respect, like the power of nature. That which is passed through the domain of consciousness is thereby transformed into an idea or picture, and so, if it comes to be uttered, it is only an idea or picture which passes from one person to another. Accordingly, any quality of mind or character that is genuine and lasting is originally unconscious, and it is only when unconsciously brought into play that it makes a profound impression. If any like quality is consciously exercised, it means that it has been worked up, it becomes intentional, and therefore matter of affectation, in other words, of deception. If a man does a thing unconsciously, it costs him no trouble, but if he tries to do it by taking trouble, he fails. This applies to the origin of those fundamental ideas which form the pith and marrow of all genuine work. Only that which is innate is genuine and will hold water. And every man who wants to achieve something, whether in practical life, in literature, or in art, must follow the rules without knowing them.
Men of very great capacity will, as a rule, find the company of very stupid people preferable to that of the common run, for the same reason that the tyrant and the mob, the grandfather and the grandchildren, are natural allies. That line of Ovid's, Ponaque cum spectant animalia cetera terram, can be applied in its true physical sense to the lower animals alone. But in metaphorical and spiritual sense it is, alas, true of nearly all men as well. All their plans and projects are merged in the desire of physical enjoyment, physical well-being. They may, indeed, have personal interests, often embracing a very varied sphere, but still these latter receive their importance entirely from the relation in which they stand to the former. This is not only proved by their manner of life and the things they say, but it even shows itself in the way they look, the expression of their physiognomy, their gait and gesticulations. Everything about them cries out, in terum prona. It is not to them, it is only to the nobler and more highly endowed natures, men who really think and look about them in the world and form exceptional specimens of humanity, that the next lines are applicable. Os homine sublime dedit coelumque tueri, iosit et iractos, ad sidera tolere vultus. No one knows what capacities for doing and suffering he has in himself until something comes to rouse them to activity, just as in a pond of still water, lying there like a mirror, there is no sign of the roar and thunder with which it can leap from the precipice and yet remain what it is, or again rise high in the air as a fountain. When water is as cold as ice, you can have no idea of the latent warmth contained in it. Why is it that, in spite of all the mirrors in the world, no one really knows what he looks like? A man may call to mind the face of his friend, but not his own. Here, then, is an initial difficulty in the way of applying the maxim, Know thyself. This is partly, no doubt, to be explained by the fact that it is physically impossible for a man to see himself in the glass, except with face turned straight towards it, and perfectly motionless. For the expression of the eye, which counts for so much, and really gives its whole character to the face, is to a great extent lost. But coexisting with this physical impossibility, there seems to me to be an ethical impossibility, of an analogous nature and producing the same effect. A man cannot look upon his own reflection as though the person presented there were a stranger to him, and yet this is necessary if he is to take an objective view. In the last resort, an objective view means a deep-rooted feeling on the part of the individual as a moral being, that that which he is contemplating is not himself, and unless he can take this point of view, he will not see things in a really true light, which is possible only if he is alive to their actual defects, exactly as they are. Instead of that, when a man sees himself in the glass, something out of his own egotistic nature whispers to him to take care to remember that it is no stranger but himself that he is looking at, and this operates as a noli me tang ere and prevents him from taking an objective view. It seems, indeed, as if, without the leaven of a grain of malice, such a view were impossible. According as a man's mental energy is exerted or relaxed, will life appear to him either so short and petty and fleeting that nothing can possibly matter over which it is worth his while to spend emotion, that nothing really matters, whether it is pleasure or riches or even fame, and that, in whatever way a man may have failed, he cannot have lost much. Or, on the other hand, life will seem so long, so important, so all in all, so momentous, 
and so full of difficulty, that we have to plunge into it with our whole soul, if we are to obtain a share of its goods, make sure of its prizes, and carry out our plans. This latter is the imminent and common view of life. It is what Gratian means when he speaks of the serious way of looking at things. Tomar mue de veras el viver. The former is the transcendental view, which is well expressed in Ovid's Non est tanti. It is not worth so much trouble. Still better, however, by Plato's remark that nothing in human affairs is worth any great anxiety. This condition of mind is due to the intellect having got the upper hand in the domain of consciousness, where, freed from the mere service of the will, it looks upon the phenomena of life objectively, and so cannot fail to gain a clear insight into its vain and futile character. But, in the other condition of mind, will predominates, and the intellect exists only to light it on its way to the attainment of its desires. A man is great or small according as he leans to the one or to the other of these views of life. People of very brilliant ability think little of admitting their errors and weaknesses, or of letting others see them. They look upon them as something for which they have duly paid, and instead of fancying that these weaknesses are a disgrace to them, they consider that they are doing them an honor. This is especially the case when the errors are of the kind that hang together with their qualities, conditionis sine quibus non, or as George Sand said, le défaut de ses vertus. Contrarily, there are people of good character and irreproachable intellectual capacity who, far from admitting the few little weaknesses they have, conceal them with care, and show themselves very sensitive to any suggestion of their existence. And this, just because their whole merit consists in being free from error and infirmity. If these people are found to have done anything wrong, their reputation immediately suffers. With people of only moderate ability, modesty is mere honesty. But with those who possess great talent, it is hypocrisy. Hence, it is just as becoming in the latter to make no secret of the respect they bear themselves and no disguise of the fact that they are conscious of unusual power, as it is in the former to be modest. Valerius Maximus gives some very neat examples of this in his chapter on self-confidence. De fiducia sui. Not to go to the theater is like making one's toilet without a mirror. But it is still worse to take a decision without consulting a friend. For a man may have the most excellent judgment in all other matters, and yet go wrong in those which concern himself because here the will comes in and deranges the intellect at once. Therefore, let a man take counsel of a friend. A doctor can cure everyone but himself. If he falls ill, he sends for a colleague. In all that we do, we wish, more or less, to come to the end. We are impatient to finish and glad to be done. But the last scene of all, the general end, is something that, as a rule, we wish as far off as may be. Every parting gives a foretaste of death. Every coming together again a foretaste of the resurrection. This is why even people who were indifferent to each other rejoice so much if they come together again after twenty or thirty years' separation. Intellects differ from one another in a very real and fundamental way, but no comparison can well be made by merely general observations. It is necessary to come close and to go into details, for the difference that exists cannot be seen from afar, and it is not easy to judge by outward appearances, as in the several cases of education.